So, so just to, to very briefly introduce today's conversation, um, uh, as Stephanie said, I'm a freelance curator based in London and I, I work a lot around questions about the art market and its relationship to public museums and thinking in particular, I guess, in the UK context about how that's changing um, and how we're maybe redefining some of those roles and rethinking the relationships between ideas about kind of private passions and civic discourse. Um, so today's conversation is really exciting for me because it's it's really a way of um, thinking about how a series of five different kind of very different individuals working in very different contexts have all started from that position perhaps of being a private collector and then developed um, something a bit more public and developed something that supports artists and really thinks about the ways in which different artistic voices, different ecosystems, different modes of curating, presentation, so on, um, can really be generated from what start out as very kind of private um, uh, 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 passions and private kind of motivations um, so I think that what we're going to do is just start off with um, a kind of very general introduction from each of the five panellists and then I, maybe I've got a few questions um, that, that to de develop a bit of a conversation between everybody um, so as Stephanie said um, we've got five uh, speakers and in no particular order I wanted to kind of introduce them and allow them to really tell you something about their own uh, practice and their own development. So I'm going to start with Daisuke Miyatsu, um, who's here from, from Tokyo. Um, and he's really he described, I don't know if it's a self-description or a description that you've been given of, of the salaryman collector. Um, and this idea of over a number of years having tried to kind of collect without a large budget. Um, and so, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you worked on. I know that you've had your house designed by artists, um, that you work, you've got a series of tattoos on your back, which I've been lucky enough to see before, that have each been designed by artists. Um, and most recently, of course, you started teaching. Um, so perhaps you can tell us something about how you really started out as a collector and how that's developed into something that is very much about those relationships with artists. Uh, thank you very much for introducing me. Taja Hao, Oja Gonjin Tafu. I am just an uh, okay, almost collector here, uh, very wealthy, but uh, I am just an uh, uh, ordinary guy, like a salaryman in Japan. I don't have uh, much enough uh, budget to get a collection. So my way is a different, bit different from other way. So the first, so the, I am collecting the very regular way, and then the I found in Japan uh, renting money from bank very low interest and a long time for building my house. So I started build my house with my artist friends. Dominic Gonzalez first designed my house, and the Yayoi Kusama created a full length mirror, and another Yoshitomo-san, so the drawing black ink painting on the Japanese sliding door for my Japanese room. And also the, uh, almost my regular collection in very professional stage, same temperature, same uh, humidity, but I really want to live with my collection until my death. So I found the another collection. I got a tattoo as art collection. The discussion for a long time with artists, and they decided the, uh, um, not design, but art for my back. And uh, my friend, they are like a tattoo curator, so they're uh, looking for the great tattoo artists, matching with every different artist, so now I have some correction on my back, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Patricia, I wanted to move to you. Um, as Stephanie said, you're the, you're the founder and president of the Foundation Sandretto Rebedingo. Re, Re um, but you started collecting in the 90s um, and have uh, opened the foundation in 97. So, so that's now tw more than 20 years of running what has become an incredibly kind of well-respected um, collection. And you're on all sorts of councils and boards and advisory panels. And I wondered again if you could tell us a tiny bit 
about that journey, how you started collecting in the first place, and then what motivated you to not only to start the foundation in the beginning, but, but to carry on developing it um, in very different kind of modes and now working a lot in partnership over 25, nearly 30 years, maybe. Yes, 20, 26 years. So, first of all, welcome. Good, good evening. Good morning. No, now what time is now? <laughs> so, thank you, Arbaze, for inviting me. Thank you, Lord, thank you to, to you for this great opportunity to talk about my, my experience. Yes, I'm starting collecting some years ago. Uh, it was 1992. I, I live in Italy. My foundation is in Italy. But for me, it was so important to go to London in 1992 and to start to visit artists. If I have to say what completely changed my life, what, what is that contemporary art give you this great opportunity not only to collect, but to know the artists, to talk with them, to understand what there is behind their work. And this, for me, was something fantastic. And so I start uh, buying, I start traveling, visiting museum, gallery, fairs, uh, biennial, and so on. It was not like now, it was bad, easier. There were not so many events like now, but there was still some. And uh, so I started to understand that collecting was fantastic, that I like to have a relation with the artist, but was not enough for me. I really understood that I wanted to be much more involved in the art process, that I want really to, to work with the artists in which I believe, that I wanted to commission new work, to produce new work, even if I want to say that I always buy work through the gallery. Even when we commission work, we talk with the artists regarding the, the work that we are producing, but uh, regarding the economic aspect, we are always working with the, with the gallery. And so I, the, this forms to commission work, to work with the artists, to support them, also to show my collection, because obviously your collection, my, for all of us, the collection is important, and so I wanted also to show, because I think that the collection doesn't stay in storage, but the collection has to, to leave, to, to give to everybody can see the work. And then maybe also the lack of institution in Italy, because now, it's different, but I want to remember that the National Museum for Contemporary Art in my country was open only in 2010. And so this means that 1992 was some years ago, and so also the idea to, to cover the lack of institution was the, the aim that gave me the desire to establish a fondazione in 1995, so free years later than I start collecting. And why a fondazione? I decided to, to do that because, as I said, I travel, I saw what was happening all over the world, and I decided to establish a fondazione because it's a, it's a very clear institution. It's a no-profit institution. We don't sell, we, we just support the artists, and we work for them, and also for our audience. We will talk later maybe about that. And so the fondazione, uh, the beginning, we didn't have a space. Finally, in, uh, we opened a new, the first space was opened in 1997 in the country, in a small village, uh, 40 minutes by car from Torino, and is an old palazzo of the 17th century, and was the first space for the Fondazione. And finally, in uh, 2002, we opened the space in Torino, which now we, we are and we work. Thank you so much. And as you say, I think we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about audiences and a little bit more about questions about also the relationship maybe between the foundation and the collection and some more kind of current projects that you've been working on. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to kind of carry on introducing all of our panelists. Uh, so next I was going to uh, uh, move to you, Luba. Um, and uh, you're the, fan the founder and the director of Isolatia in... Just the founder of Isolatia in... A originally in Donetsk and now in Kiev, um, which is a non-profit uh, platform for contemporary culture. Um, again, you're also a member of all sorts of different committees and uh, among them the Expert Council for Contemporary Art at the Ministry of Culture in Ukraine. Um, and I know that you have an incredibly kind of uh, extraordinary story to tell in terms of um, the, the, some of the history of what happened when you first set up Isolatia. Um, but I wondered if we might also start by uh, you telling us 
us something about how you first got into collecting and and how that became something that in itself um, demanded a kind of public or a more kind of public platform. Um, and again, just thinking now in terms of um, the most recent kind of uh, instigation of uh, Isolatia and that, that in fact has moved on even from just being about contemporary art to being something a bit more broader. Everything is two minutes or three minutes. Have five. Okay, have five. <laughs> take five okay thank you so much for coming here and thank you for inviting us to to be on this panel i'm very proud that the local agent you know we are local uh, we here present i don't know the globe and uh, it's uh, i'm really proud to be beyond uh, the people who are sitting here so my story is uh, maybe a little bit different um, than everyone i am from industrial i'm from industrial background I am from industrial city of Donetsk, which is a coal mine city, econ uh, economical capital of Ukraine, where culture was not on the first uh, row. So it was a football, it was something else. So I started into my background industry, my father industrialist, my husband industrialist. So my, my business, I come from carbon business and uh, culture and art was always my passion and my love. And uh, so, but in this country, in this time, you, you can't have this profession, you know, it's not serious. So that is why I start in the uh, early 80s, uh, during the um, Soviet Union, fall of Soviet Union, I, and seen collapse of Soviet Union, I've seen all of this beautiful, at my understanding, uh, works of social realism disappearing. So I start, my, my way of collector start as a way of saving Collect, saving our past, and I thought it was wise to to try to save everything which is a from uh, which is disappearing in history. So I started locally collector of contemporary of uh, social realism, uh, Soviet style, and then I slowly move with uh, growing my business, traveling around the world, as Patricia said. So I slowly move to contemporary art. And I start to collect international artists, uh, participate in fair, so classical way of West uh, collector, trying copy, let's say. So then uh, time turns, and then uh, in 2010, I decide that uh, it's time to bring back to the city, which give me this chance to see the world and see how opportunity art can give the world and open mind of young people. In 2010, I decide to open the first art uh, um, institution in actually this type and the territory of industrial space in the city of Donetsk. It was like uh, aliens comes from moon to the city where the football, a little bit ballet, and nobody knows what contemporary art is. So my goal was to introduce the contemporary art and introduce the um, energy and possibility and um, involve local community and uh, so then I shift my, my interest shift from collecting of uh, uh, collecting in direct meaning to um, inviting artists and commission them to produce site specific works in the territory of the plant which was a huge one seven and a half hectare 88 buildings so it's a big size Plant. So we invite a big, uh, big name artists like Tsang Tsang Tsang, Daniel Buren, so to, to produce, or many others, to produce pieces on the territory of the plant involving local community. We also did a lot of uh, residences, so on, so on, a lot of programs. And then, um, you know, history make a turn and suddenly we become a zone of war. And uh, unfortunately, East Ukraine was actually de facto occupied by Russia, and uh, uh, our territory of our place was taken and converted to art center, or converted to prison. So this is, was a moment when I lost two thirds of my collection, and actually it was a crucial moment of my approach to collecting. So I completely lost interest after the pain, after a lot of... Uh, emotion and completely lost interest to um, uh, be collector in classical way to accumulate uh, as uh, objects, art objects, and create a portfolio around this. So I move, we move to Kiev, and we suddenly move to the topic culture and conflict. What is the role of culture before, during, or after conflict? So we try to expand, um, the, try to, to, to give a voice to artists who expand the topic of the hybrid war, of um, refugees, uh, of the moving borders. So it takes a couple of years for us, and then 
Actually, we are four years already in Kiev, and then in 2015, we launched a project which called um, iZone, where Isolatia, and we create a place which called iZone. So it's a project, um, uh, iZone Creative Community, which um, actually a community of creative people, uh, all different multidisciplinary um, directions, all kind of um, art, high tech, so all creative possibility in the um, field of culture. So this is where we are now. And this is actually through the iZone now, it's our main project. Isolatia through the iZone try to um, make a, so we try to come to the new, new page of uh, where the contemporary art can be very, very useful to boost uh, young talents, not only in art, but in creative sector, to give them a voice and to give them a sustainable model of um, living together. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, so moving on, Jumana, um, again, you, I mean, it sounds like you're working in, in, a, in a situation that has, I mean, not similar situation in terms of the context, but, but a way of thinking about what's not already there and how to develop a kind of ecosystem and a set of conversations. Um, so you studied art and architecture in Paris originally and then lived in L.A. for a long time and moved back to Beirut in 2004. Six, I've got it written down here. Um, so you, you began to collect at that point, uh, and then finally, maybe 10 years later, you just most recently opened a gallery. So I wondered if you could tell us a tiny bit about that trajectory and why specifically the idea of a commercial gallery in, in Beirut. Yeah, so actually, it's funny. I started collecting with a poster. It was a poster of Le Corbusier that I've seen when I was living in Los Angeles. A poster for a show he has done at the Modern Museum in 1962. And that was the beginning of what I can say, my collecting. Uh, it has, the poster had a story, it was the Corbusier, the composition, etc. And uh, when I arrived in Beirut, end of 2005, beginning of 2006, um, the situation was really tough. I landed when they have killed a prominent voice of human rights. He was a journalist. So I arrived in a very tense city. Uh, two months later, my father, who had a bank, had it burned down by protesters. Uh, they were protesting against the Danish caricature that happened at the time. They were burning all the Danish embassies in the Middle East. Uh, so I witnessed, there, I witnessed that, and I'm there. And I felt that I had to do something in the city, because now I was living there. Um, and I felt that it was totally absurd. So my collection took another turn. Not my collection, the fact of collecting took another turn where I started supporting the local art scene. And I found this amazing and very dynamic scene uh, of uh, institutions. I joined them. I joined Ashkal Alwan. Uh, I was part of the board. I uh, built a library. I have building the library there. I supported the Beirut Art Center uh, with shows by Richter, Pennoni. So it was great to have all these huge artists in Beirut and showing them to the local community. I also supported uh, artists from Lebanon outside in the Venice Biennale or at the V&A. And then, you know, with all that, I, I have met all these artists, I have had great conversations with them, and I've seen the Beirut scene evolving, and I've seen that there was a lack for spaces, not non-profit spaces, there was enough of that, and they were all struggling to find money, but for actually spaces for production and spaces that were commercially also viable for the artists themselves. So this is how the idea of the gallery came about. It came with a lot of conversations, it came with a lot of discussions. Uh, it wasn't easy because today uh, opening a gallery is not an easy thing, especially in Beirut where it's a very small city uh, and I'm showing contemporary, but it was so needed and especially the artists themselves um, were they have those amazing projects that are very reflective and very deep about what's going on around us. So I opened in October 2015. We've done eight shows so far. We've done two fairs. Uh, and it's been a very, very interesting journey and very important. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. And finally, Rudy, you've been very patient sitting on the end waiting for, 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 for everybody else. Um, so you have taken a journey which has started off being a collector and become a, a curator and also an, a professor of art in, in Taipei. Um, so I wonder if you, if you again might just talk us through that process of, of, of starting off collecting when you started and then how that has evolved and developed over time. Uh, well, I uh, I have to say that you know Taiwan have a, a little bit like a long collection history, uh, starting from 1990. There are like two auction house, uh, Sotheby and Christie. They have an auction in Taiwan for 10 years, and then after that they moved to uh, Hong Kong mainly because of the tax issue. But for these 10 years, uh, it really create a lot of uh, uh, great collectors there. Uh, and uh, actually, I, my background uh, starting from advertising agency, and then I moved to film industry. Uh, uh, you know, as a as a film uh, maker and film pr promoter. Uh, then uh, I was hired by uh, Disney as a the the country manager for Disney uh, Taiwan uh, for 13 years. And uh, unlike Daisuke Miyazaki's son, uh, he's a full uh, he's a salary man collector. And I'm uh, after the you know 13 years with Disney, I left and quit my job and I become a full-time collector. And then since then, I uh, but before that, actually, I, I collect works for like around 25 years, uh, starting from like modern Chinese, overseas Chinese uh, painting, and some of the what we call the first generation uh, painter that study during World War One, World War Two in Japan. And then I switched to YBA, a young British artist. Uh, at that time, uh, I have a friend, uh, Eugene Tan, who now uh, the director for Singapore National Art Gallery. He was pursue his PhD degree there, so I visit him from time to time, and he took me to different uh, studio visiting. And so since then, I switched to contemporary, uh, then uh, like Taiwanese contemporary, uh, Asian contemporary, Japanese contemporary, then all over the place. Uh, my collection now uh, more focusing on the uh, uh, Asian artists who are now very active in international market, uh, such as Yen Vo, Hegu Yang, Li Ming Wei, Li Kit, uh, Shimabuku. And actually, I put up some of the slides here because uh, I, I try to pull out for my collection. And uh, some of the, my collection have some uh, dialogue in between each other. And it's regarding trash. Uh, a little bit like, you know, like, uh, I won't say it like uh, trash, but uh, it's very close in concept. Like this image you saw is Abraham Cus Villagas. He used all these homemade uh, materials, like, piled up together. And then Shimabuku, uh, there is a wonderful work by him called Octopus Stone. Uh, uh, you know, he worked with animal, and Octopus actually is a big collector. They are very super smart uh, animal, and they collect uh, shares and storms and hire like around their cave. Uh, so the artist Shimabuku like collect all this storm and make it into his own work. And then you will also see the uh, Li Mingwei work there. Uh, it's called Storm Journey, and uh, you know to to make the hour become real. Like there are two storms there, and you had to give away. Uh, uh, one work back to the nature, whether it's a nature stone or a Frepica one. So uh, I, I kind of like enjoy curating some of my collection works, and I change my work like in a random, probably like half uh, half year or a quarter base, uh, doing a little bit my uh, uh, practice. Uh, and now actually, uh, I try to stay in different city every year uh, for a few weeks or months. I starting from New York City. Uh, I continue doing that for five years, and the longest time is like three months, and the shortest time is one month. And last year I was in Paris. I was in Berlin before, and this year I will back to go back to Paris and and, and London. And to, to do the long staying actually is to, to kind of like reach out to the, the city uh, that, you know, there are a lot of collector, uh, not only the collector, but the artists and museum people there. So I can learn from different city and to see the art things there. So uh, I, I really enjoyed those kind of like uh, long staying uh, process. 
Thank you so much. So, I mean, we've touched on all sorts of really interesting kind of questions already, I guess, partly about questions about audience and about local uh, local artists and local art scenes, um, but also about new models and, and what's kind of important and useful given particular contexts. Um, the first question I, I, I would like to ask um, kind of comes from partly what you were just talking about, Rudy, and I, and I hope speaks to Patricia as well, is something about the relationship then between a collection and a foundation or a curatorial practice. Um, and for you, how those two things link and, and where they link and, and whether they should be kept separate or whether or not you're curating, when you're curating from your collection, what that means, how you think about works that happen in the foundation, or for part of your curatorial exhibitions? Yes. So, first of all, I'm a collector. I have to say, for me, it's so important to be here, to see the fair, to see the artist. And as I say, it's so, so fantastic because if you collect contemporary art, really, you can, as you say before, you can really talk with the artist, understand what there is behind this work. And this is really something so important for me. For me, it's always important. What, as I say, at a certain point of my, of my life, I thought that uh, I could do much more than just to collect, and it's for that that I established the Fondazione. My collection is on permanent loan to the Fondazione, it's traveling with the name of the Fondazione. In fact, now, if you have the chance to go to Shanghai, to the Rakban Museum, we just opened last Friday uh, an exhibition with, uh, with a selection of work from my collection. And so this is a way in which I try to work. Um, Shanghai, next month another part of the collection will open in United Kingdom. Uh, last year we went to, two years ago we went to Quito in Ecuador. And made, so the collection is really traveling because as I say, I have not to stay and storage, but and at the same time, I don't want to use the foundation spaces to show my collection. I mean, my the, the, the foundation is not the house of my collection, because in the Fondazione, at the Fondazione, we want to do much more, we want really to be involved with the, with the artist. And it's also for that, that in 2020, I will open a new space in Spain, in Madrid. When you see the photo, you will see there is the new space that is an old building, so different from the building in Torino. In Torino was a building from scratch, so a new building made by uh, an architect, Cla Claudio Silvestrini, an architect living in London. Instead, the new building will be very different. It's an old building, listed, and inside, David J will do works for the new space. What we do in the Fondazione? In the Fondazione, first of, all, first of all, we support the artist, and this is really, really important. So as I say, we don't show the collection work, but their work, as all of us, we commission. I really believe that it's so important not only to buy, but also to commission. And uh, we have different ways to commission, because sometimes uh, um, we ask to some artists and we commission the work for exhibition. Other times, uh, um, like we did, we saw for Yan Chen exhibition and, um, and for many exhibitions that happen in Torino. Other times are the artists that come to ask us to support them. For example, we support Philippe Arenau, uh, Douglas Gordon for the work on Zinedine Zidane, on the football player, we talk about football. Uh, other, this, for example, Adrian Villa Rojas was a huge exhibition, it's all the space, we use all the space, we gave all the space to Adrian Villa Rojas that uh, produced a new work with uh, 100 big stones comes from, uh, from Turkey. Uh, and this is important, really important, uh, as we produce work for the Bayern, and for big events. But as the same importance for me is education, children, all what needs uh, education, to, to educate uh, our visitors. Why this? Because when I started Collect Contemporary Art, it was very difficult for me because I graduated in economics, in business, so I didn't study art. At the beginning, it was difficult. I could, was not easy to understand the work of art. And so for that I say, if one day I will have my spaces, I really would like that everybody 
that come to visit me can understand. And so um, we don't do things easy, but we give to everybody the tool to understand. And for example, for that, for me, it's very important to have my mediators in our exhibition uh, room in, that are always there are young, but are all graduated, are all well prepared, and they just talk, dialogue with the, our auditors, creating this relation that I believe that is very important. And I want to I want to carry on talking about education and and, and, and audiences, but but I also just want to go back quickly and, and and ask Rudy about how the relationship now between his collection and and I I we I know that we had a conversation maybe a year or so ago where you said that you had a huge number of works in storage and that that was becoming more and more of a kind of problem for you, um, but also this idea of of what it means to be a curator as well as a collector um, and how you. you use your collection as part of your curatorial process? Well, actually, when, uh, when the first time that I, I become a, a curator, it was, a, it was a, like during the Taipei affair, and there's no activity at all uh, at night, at the opening night. And I, I feel so sad because I, I went to a small restaurant and I met some Japanese collector there. And I... Uh, a friend of mine was talking that, you know, we should do something this year uh, to at least encourage people to attend some event. So my friend have a, a huge furniture store. So, so that was the first time that I, I put up a show there. And I, uh, it's kind of like Japanese painting and then Taiwanese painting show together. And then since then, it's just rolling out. And for those shows that I curated, mainly I don't put my collection there. Uh, there actually, there is a... Uh, there's an opportunity, there's a Yokohama Museum uh, a chief curator uh, trying to ask if I can put out my collection only uh, uh, on Taiwanese contemporary uh, in their museum because he wanted to show that how I promote the Taiwanese uh, artists. But then, you know, he left, so the, the exhibition didn't uh, went through. So uh, then after that, I was, uh, I was invited to curate the show at the Dojima River Biennale uh, for the third edition. And, and some of the artists that actually is, uh, is my close friend, uh, I collected. But uh, actually the, the show has a theme, uh, it's called Little Water. So I encourage everybody to create their new worlds. Uh, uh, so it's, it's most of the, the artists that I know very well, like uh, Wolfgang uh, Leib, you know, he, he, he put up some new work there. And, and some new uh, artists like Li Mingwei, he has some old work that, that I think is suitable for my theme so, uh, that I invited. So I, I still didn't have a chance to put up my, uh, my collection uh, as only one single show. A uh, few years ago, Hong Kong Art Center, they have a kind of like collector show, but they have five collectors coming from Taiwan. And I think they mix all the collection together. So in the end, I didn't... Uh, I, did, I didn't agree to participate. So hopefully in the future I will have a chance to, to, to put up my collections on the show. And, and so to, to move on to this question of, of audiences, um, I guess I wanted maybe to start with you, Luba, and, and to think about um, who comes to Isolatia now and how you're trying to develop those audiences. And I guess in that sense, what kind of responsibilities the, the, the organization has taken on, not only for, for thinking about contemporary art, but also thinking maybe about a broader kind of socioeconomic responsibility within the context? Yes, as I tell you, that, as I tell you that I come from a very different um, geopolitical and historical context, and so uh, originally we come to um, to start contemporary art center just to develop local community, as it was very important for me. And moving back in Kiev, Kiev is a capital, and it's a very advanced uh, city in certain way of youth, of young generation. So the content of, content of Ukraine is, uh, from one side, is uh, almost three decades of corrupt and incompetent uh, government, which is uh, also now under the pressure, with the pressure of very aggressive uh, neighbor, I mean Russia, and war. And from other side, the, the growing uh, class of young talent and young, um, actually, uh, generation uh, who are very um, uh, willing to be a, um, to, to be a cultural producer. So we try to, with our new model, uh, 
of um, hub, let's say, which focus for uh, creative as a creative cluster. We try to serve needs of this new generation, a new stage, uh, new generation who are looking for infrastructure in a bigger, bigger scale uh, to support the young talent and entrepreneurship uh, to find their way. So um, it's like big experiment at the moment and we try to synchronize uh, the needs and opportunity but I would like to say that uh, the Isolatia as a cultural foundation is, is a heart of this hub. So the culture is a driving force, is a catalyst I mean art, contemporary art is a catalyst of all processes which are going on around. Could you just give us some kind of like concrete examples of, of the kinds of projects that you're doing and the, and the way that they're working within within um, the, I the, the city? I was in the city. So we work also within the city and we do projects like one of the projects called Social Contract. It's a, uh, you know, we are rethinking a commemoral, um, you know, this, what, what is a, a public space, whom it's belong. You know, Ukraine came, move out of communism, where the Lenin mo was a main idol. And for example, we develop a project inviting a, a commission, as you said, um, very important in, uh, Ukrainian international artist to, um, to discuss between the art community, uh, society and authorities whom belongs the, the project. And one of the pictures you see, uh, for example, in the, f in the falling monument of Lenin, which was after revolution, 2014, we have in Ukraine like Lenin a fall, like thousands of Lenin was crashed from the main squares. And the question what will be in the public space, who and what has a right to put there. So we do, we support um, young artists, uh, local artists through the residency, through commission. We also do um, uh, design and creative and uh, uh, technology involving uh, classes and um, inviting, uh, inviting uh, different uh, successful people from um, creative industry to promote uh, to promote the um, creative way of living and of thinking and an internship. And um, Jumana, perhaps you could also uh, tell us a little bit in that way about how, how um, you're thinking about not just supporting artists and not just working within the market, but very much developing um, partnerships and uh, thinking about audiences in terms of what you do at the, at the gallery. Yes, totally. Actually, in terms of audiences, we, tar we try to target a very wide audience because what we're showing at the gallery is quite much conceptual and not necessarily easy to understand uh, in Beirut. So what I do also to complement that is with every show I do a small publication uh, and I ask someone to intervene or the artist to intervene and that completes the work and that completes the production and what is behind the project. So that is something we do that's quite interesting and that we just distribute. We don't sell it, we just give it to whoever is interested, whoever comes. So that's part of the production and that's part of targeting a wider audience. We, again, Beirut is a small city and there's not many, many collectors, but what's interesting is that uh, with the media, with the social media, and with, uh, and actually our location, because we're located in the port, and we're located in an area that's, uh, yeah, you too. <laughs> so it's an area that's, well, it's, it's at the entrance of the city, and no one has ever ventured that. It's the custom area, it's an area where everyone was scared to go there. And the gallery is two garages. So people are intrigued as, where it is, as how a contemporary gallery can evolve there. Uh, we have refugee live, we have two families of refugee living next to us, and during the day it's super busy with all the, you know, all the custom people, and at night it's very quiet, in the afternoon actually when they leave it's very quiet, so it's also that there's a very special energy that attracts uh, the audience around and the local community around. And can you see the impact that that's having already? It's having a great impact. It, um, it, it's getting a big impact, actually. People are very intrigued, are very interested. The shows are different, but it's true that they're mostly Lebanese artists, but it's, it, there's something at, I mean, the, there's a high level of quality that they're showing and the project themselves and the thinking and 
all those ideas. So it's quite, it's having a great impact. And um, Patricia, I wonder if you could also tell us something a little bit, I mean, just really in terms of kind of concrete examples of, of the kind of education programs that you're working yes. on. Um, I mean, not just actually at the foundation, but also, I mean, for example, I was lucky enough to come to see one of the shows that you did up in Sheffield in the north of England, uh, maybe two years ago that was that was a really kind of interesting new model of, of private collections working in public galleries and really thinking about how to introduce uh, that as a mode of working and I know that you're working on a new project now up in Rochdale in the in the north of England also um, and we were talking a couple of days ago about how how you're really thinking not just about um, a kind of general education program but quite specific ideas around the kinds of works that you might put into that show and the relationship that they might have to a local audience. Yes, first of all, I want to say that uh, it's so interesting to listen to the other speakers like now. So, and it's always a good occasion also for our collector to have the opportunity to talk together, to know much more about our collection. And uh, yes, because in this case, Rudy and me, we work in a different way. We are, we, all of us, we love art so much, but we work after to be collector we have a different way to work no i'm so when you say i collect my collect i curated the, the exhibition with my collection instead in my case i never never curated an exhibition of my collection so it's good to know different point of view and in my case for example i saw that there is mark rappel here in the room mark curated just from the 25th year of my collection together with Tom Eccles and Liam Gillick, the artist, they, I invited them to curate the, you know, my collection to show to the city of Torino. And it was, and was fantastic, fantastic. And the same happened for the Rockbund. In the Rockbund, I didn't choose the work. And in this case, it was made by the curator, of, by the director and the chief curator of the Rockbund Museum. And generally, this is my way to work, not curated. Even if I pay attention, I'm very curious, I want to be part of the process. And uh, what I say regarding uh, the, the collection, yes, I really, yes, I really believe that... Uh, the role of the collector is not only to be a collector and to have the collector hang in the wall of the house. I really believe that we have to, to find new way, like you see now Sheffield that you were just talking about. In this case, Sheffield, the city in UK, they, they wanted to, they don't have so many collection in their public museum. And so they invited a group of collectors, we were five, to show some works in, from our collection in, pra, in public spaces. And it was a fantastic experience because really when you see your collection in a different space, in my case was in a cathedral, was in a church, it's something that really changes your point of view and is also the best way to show collection, to give the opportunity to everybody to see contemporary art. Because can you imagine people that was going to the church for masses and, found, and they found it work of art, and even particular work of art, because the dean of the church wants really to, to show strong work. I have some work quite, quite not easy, but he wanted to show because he said we have to talk about problem, about the situation of life in Sheffield. And the same will happen in, now in Rothschild, where I've been invited to show a part of my female collection, because my collection have some, is a collection, it's a global collection, but there are some focus, some strength that I really like, like female artists. And in this case, Mark Doyle, the curator, invited me to show only female artist and he decided to do that because he thinks that to show a work from female artists in a place in which life is not always easy for women can be a good way to talk about uh, refugee, single mother, uh, anorexia, so to talk about uh, different subjects and this is really what I think that have to be a collection, a collection have to, to be used, to be no, not only is from all of us that we like art and when we go to the museum and so it's normal we go to the museum we know what, what we will see. It's so important I believe that the collection go outside from our museum, from our private spaces from, and everybody really can 
have this opportunity to see art because contemporary art is so important for our life and this is what I'm trying to do. Maybe we talk later about education because I really believe that uh, we have to teach from the children when they are two years old and we start with children to go up to older person and people with special needs and so on. But maybe I have to give the... No, you I, can, don't want yeah. to, I don't want to talk too much. So, I, I mean, to, speaking of the idea of, of people having very different ways of, of, of developing and, and of thinking about this thing, Daisuke, I wondered if you might come in and now tell us a tiny bit more about actually what has become a very personal collection and, a, and, a, and a, in a very different kind of a way, um, a very direct uh, interaction with artists that is something that is, is literally physically kind of embedded on your body. Um, the other characters talking about the, their own collection and the how to make their collection. The, we have a every different way to correct our collection, making our collection. So the, unfortunately, so that I don't have the space for showing my collection. Almost so the, uh, my collection is in the stages. Um, but uh, my house is a uh, um, building with my friend's artist, but uh, very as uh, same as a normal Japanese house, so very small. But uh, I invite my friend, so the artist, curator, collector, so that when they are coming to Japan, and uh, yeah, they cook for them, and uh, sometimes they. they yeah, some of artists, so that when so that they arrived at the Narita airport and they, in the middle way to go to central Tokyo, they got a rest at my house and they're taking the bus and they're yeah, getting food and they sleep and they go to the gallery and the museum. I want my space so that uh, is uh, like a small hub for them. So the, the very big um, charm of contemporary art artist is living. So if we want to talk with Van Gogh or Johannes Ferme, we cannot do that, of course. But uh, we can talk about many things, and sometimes so they have brunch or dinner also with artists, even Gerhard Richter to very young artists. That's a very big point of correcting uh, contemporary art. So the for me, uh, it's very important to talk, discuss with artists. Not only artists, but also the curator, galleries, yeah, collectors. Uh, same as correcting artworks. So my house project and the tattoo project, so the very important part is discussion with artists. This is a, a very good sample. The when I ask the tattoo project with Ryan Gander. So the, I asked Ryan first time that he think he thought about it very long time. And the, I waited for one year, waiting for his reply. And the, yeah, the, his idea is this is like a, uh, like a missing object. So the on over Tintin the French magazine, there you can see this, right? Yeah, that's, uh, the title is Missing Object. After getting tattoo, I went to hotel room to see Ryan Gander. The Ryan asked me, Daisuke, so what's missing object for you? So we discussed the missing object. I found the tattoo is, it's like a certificate or a, like that. But the talking with Ryan is a real piece. So talking with artists, so that sometimes it's like uh, yeah, the same as a uh, uh, art piece. I think, yeah. And are there other people on the panel then that for whom that relationship with artists? I mean, no matter how public your your projects have become and how big your projects have become, is it still the case that in, that, that relationships with artists are are really core to to developing what you do further? In my case, the, the collaboration with the artists is what that's one of the strongest part of uh, having a gallery is how you mount a project, how you have all these discussions, the, how you collaborate, how you think, and how you get 
to 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 produce at the end, and that's what amazing. Well, that's what's great. And then when you open the show and all the, you know, it's it's a collaboration. We are two in this process. I mean, two as me showing, but it's um, it's very important, and it creates something at a in a different level, uh, definitely. For what I think that is also important and what I'm trying to do, I'm doing, is also to create collaboration between institutions together to commission work to artists. For example, um, I'm in I'm different committee, but I'm also in the, in the Philadelphia Museum, in the advisory committee, and uh, we decided two, three, no, three years ago to commission work to artists working with video, film, uh, performance, so medium that are a little bit much more difficult, generally for the collector or for the museum. And so we, we started two years ago, and we, we chose the first artist, this will, be, will be, because we will show next, in the next month, will be Rachel Rose, the artist from American artist, video artist, and she started two years ago to work on this commission and now on May the 1st we will show the work before in, at Philad in Philadelphia and then in November in Torino. And I think that is very interesting also the process to work together with museum, to think an artist, to invite the artist, to produce the work. In this case is a co-production and a co-acquisition. That means we we buy, we bought the, the work, so the boat will belong to the two institutions. And I think that is another way to, to support the artist and to be, to be part of this world, but at the same in the same time create collaboration, not only just by myself. Well, I, I, I actually joined a, a, a annual conference by Seaman uh, uh, last year in Singapore, and a lot of uh, museum. It's an organization actually formed by all the museum director and chief curator. So it's about like 300 people from all over the world. And we have an annual meeting every year, and I become a member as an independent curator, uh, invite, uh, invited by Francis Morris. Uh, actually, last uh, annual conference, the, theme, uh, the main question is actually, uh, nowadays all the museum and institutions have really lack of budget. And how, under those kind of circumstances, and how can you create and increase your collections? And there are lots of discussion, and the main uh, solution, one of the main solutions actually is work with artists, commission with artists. And I think these also apply to the individual collector. And I think, I know uh, Miyazu San Taisuke for a very long time, and I think he, he really grew his uh, collection from the scratch and starting from very, very young. And, and I think he tried to work with the artists directly and, 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 and try to find out a way and solution. And the artwork is really fitting to his collections. And I think these probably the, the really the practice, uh, not only for individual collector, but also apply to the, the, the National Museum these days. It, it, instead, for example, in Italy, we create a, you talk about group that put together, we created an association, we are 15 foundation from Torino to Venezia and from Milano to Sicily, and uh, we, we created this commission, and the, our aim is to work together to support the artist, and now we're working on a project in which we really believe for 2019 to put together our collection and to open a big exhibition in all Italy, in all our spaces, with Italian artists. So I believe that it's, we have to find new way to, to work together because I really believe that it's so important to collaborate in order to support our artists from our country or from all over the world. And this is, I think, the direction not to work each one just for our institution, but to find collaboration with other museum, with other private foundation. And this is what I'm trying to do in Italy. Not easy, obviously, because there is always the ego all all a collector, no, that want to. But I think that uh, if we go in this direction, I think that would be a good way to, to reduce also the cost, because you know, in this case you can buy work together, and at the same time to give much more support and help to many artists. 
And I mean, Luba, likewise, yeah, you've spoken. And, uh, uh, just from my point, I also want to say that uh, we try, we, we also do all of this, and we commission artists, we support, support young Ukrainian artists, we bring in residency uh, international artists, we are part of different, uh, different uh, uh, institutional nets, uh, so on, so on. But what we try to do now with this ISON hybrid model, we try to give a chance to, to um, make, to infrastructure in more wider look for the artistic support. Is it only just one artist commission or something? We try to give them possibility to meet different people and to mix with IT people. Like um, so in our hub, some artists can meet people who are involved in the virtual reality and then as a result, we see the product. You see that come with, they knock to my door and the door of our curator said, you know, we have a new idea to create a new product. And it's amazing when you see that you give them opportunity and you uh, provide more wider infrastructure for creative talents and then they themselves find a way how to collaborate between themselves. So this is a way how we try to do this model and how we try to find, um, how to say, more, more wider uh, possibility for artists and for creative class of new generation. So I think we might have a bit... Oh, gone. Um, yeah, yeah, the Rudy San, the <laughs> curating the show, so in Japan, mm -hmm. the my collection show, not only Japan, but also in Taipei. So it's like a crossing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's a very important, not only in our country, in our area, the crossing and the exchange is very, very important. And uh, yeah, the Rudy San and uh, I, were invited by the Delfina Foundation last summer. That's a yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That that did the that did the program. So the correcting as practice. That's very important. So correct. The reason told the collector should be stay the longer time in the city. That's a great chance to see more and more in the situation in the area. And and then the exchanging our idea right here. I think. Have you got something to add to that, Luba? <laughs> I was also part, I was uh, very, uh, how to say, uh, unexpectedly, uh, un unexpectedly surprised when I was invited for this first uh, by, by uh, Delfina Foundation, where usually I sent uh, artists and curator to support young Ukrainian artists curator, and I sent hundreds for during my life artists and curator to enter, to, 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 to be in residency around the world. And suddenly I was invited by Aaron to be um, part of the residency for uh, collectors, so I didn't con I didn't uh, take seriously myself as a collector, collector, collect in classic way. But then it was then they told me that uh, the way the practice of collecting is very wild, and this is where I learned that the um, the maybe the new collector who come to the market, let's say last 10, 20 years, not collector with a classic knowledge like. Sandretta, and then we can also bring something on the um, on the view and the role of co collector in uh, uh, arts, and this is uh, uh, something maybe uh, which is not exactly what is a collecting or even philanthropy is a um, like American European American European way, but maybe it's something which we bring from our contents and from our geopolitical and historical. Uh, and there in uh, Delfina, I met amazing, actually people, and my net uh, who are whose practice is even more, I can say, uh, strange than mine. So, and I think this is amazing that uh, we all um, kind of uh, join in the club of um, collecting practice, and the more wider and uh, the more um, colorful this practice will be, the better I, I hope the world will be. And, I mean, Jamana, in that sense, you, you also see this from both sides. So, so I wonder if you could talk not only about your own practice as a collector, but how you, how you go about developing collectors and, 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 and helping people to, to engage in more, in broader ways through the gallery. Yeah, but to, to go back to what Luba was saying about collecting, this is why it's called the evolving collector, because also when you... When you're not a regular, when when you were regular collectors, but what's interesting is how 
the evolution of it. And also, you, you, know, you don't only really collect, you collect ideas, you collect um, things that you want to do, especially... I, so that's what's also interesting. And as far as... Uh, yeah, as far as uh, reaching out to other collectors, that's very interesting because I put myself in their place and I really understand when they enter the gallery or when they want to acquire or when... I feel, I, I know, it's it's how they talk, it's how you put yourself in their place and then you understand and you, um, you feel compassion actually for the collector. You know, you just, so yeah. Yes, we spoke a lot about artists, but we are also really involved in the curators. Yeah. Who are, for example, with my foundation in, uh, in Italy, um, 13 years ago, we decided to start a new project that is called Young Curators Residency Program. That means that uh, every year we ask to the best in curatorial school in the world to send us the CV of a young curators. Then there is a jury every year that chooses every year three curators. The three curators from all over the world, we have also one from Ukraine, yes, from all over the world, three of them, they arrived in Italy, in Torino, and they spent four months visiting artists art studio, museum in all Italy, and they visited more than 200 artists. We don't have in Italy 200 young artists, but so they, we give them the opportunity to know. Then they come back to Torino and they curated an exhibition with the artists they, they met during this uh, travel, this trip. And uh, so they have to, to organize the, the exhibition, the, the, the concept, the title, the, they have to, to, pay, to, to think about the transport, the, the press release and everything. And I have to say that this is, for us, it's really a great opportunity to know and to, be, to have a relation with young curators from all over the world. At the same time, it's a good way to support our Italian artists because generally after that, when the curator come back to their country and they start their life, they invited our artists outside. At the same time, many museums, many galleries in Italy now invited our curator to, 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 do, to create exhibition and so on. So I really believe that in my case, the beginning, I was a collector, but what I tried to do was, yes, to, to work with the artist, but also with the curator, because I really believe that the two figures, the two are so important and needs to find a way to, to support both. And then our education, obviously, all the, our visitors are also important too, because we, we have to work it's for them. just to say that, for example, our curator was uh, in Sandretta uh, residence. It was so, so great. And uh, actually, uh, she's a, one of the best curators now in Ukraine. But she brought out of Italy not only knowledge in art, but also a husband, Italian husband. <laughs> so it's like connections between the, it's, uh, <laughs> connections so between it's, the net. So it's a good name. In fact, I talk about that just because we were yes, I think that yes, it's so important. Yes, I agree to, to find a way to to create relation and and then obviously to pay attention to our visitors. This is so important. If you if you really love art, you have also to give, as I said, the opportunity to everybody to understand art. And so for that, for example, we we do a lot of educational program. We have laboratory for children started to two years old, then student, then a lot of laboratory and workshop for adults uh, with the, also to the teacher and and then a lot of program for people with special needs because we really believe that contemporary art can be important and can be good for all of them and so this is what we try to do through the fondazione and I mean, actually, a couple of people have mentioned the, the Delfina Foundation program. Um, and I think what, what, one of the things that, that I really learned through, through kind of some engagement with that was that um, it, there was a real kind of reciprocity of that learning in the way that you're describing. It wasn't just about um, 
people coming from from outside of London and, and learning from London, but it was about a kind of uh, way in which we could exactly that have this conversation, and particularly being from a city like London, which is changing very quickly and which is really kind of undergoing a great deal of um, conversation at the moment about the future of and the sort of sustainable future of public institutions, but also the art market, even you know the kind of nuts and bolts of things like real estate and the way in which that's really affecting what's possible to do was it was really incredible to have the opportunity to to learn from other models and learn from those kind of uh, places that have different infrastructures and those different contexts and to see the ways in which those kind of urgencies have been have been developed and have been addressed in in other places and the way that we might through those conversations be able to kind of figure out a way to develop something that that supports both artists to be able to make work to be able to sell work but also as you say for audiences to continue to have the kind of opportunity to to be involved in the 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 the, the experience of being in kind of public spaces um so I, I think we've got a few more minutes and we might open it up to some questions if there are any <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I am Aaron Cesar, director of uh, Delfina Foundation, um, which has been name-checked a few times. Uh, when we started the program in London, um, it was you know, great to have the three of you, uh, Luba, Dasuke, and Rudy, participate. And I've also known Jamana for many years and Patrizia uh, most recently. So I feel like I'm unable to ask a more cutting question uh, to our panelists. Um, I was talking to David Walsh, the founder of Mona, about our Collecting as Practice program and the residencies for collectors. And he pointed to biology being a very important part of collecting. He, part, he pointed to a very particular biologist, Amots Zalavi, who has done a lot of research on the Arabian babbler, which is a bird within the Mediterranean. The Arabian babbler is one of the most altruistic birds. It gives. To, it suffers personal loss of giving. Maybe it's sticks and twigs, maybe it's worms. But it does so in order to gain social standing. So as you're evolving as collectors, I imagine that also your egos are also evolving. So how do you keep your egos in check as collectors? Don't believe so. No, no, maybe it's true. Yes, it's a way also. But I think that uh, to collect gives you so much. I, the dialogue with the artist for me was so important, and it give, I was lucky. Yes, I was lucky because I could collect, I could know the artist, I could live in, in this fantastic world. And so what I trying to do was just to give back to the society, to my city, to, to people, what I had. So I don't think that is ego. It's much more that uh, you become part of the world and you, you are lucky to do that and you want to, to, to give back what you have. Um, but, uh, but I think that obviously all of us have, is ego, all of us want to to do whatever, but I don't, I'm not sure that we do that just because we know, we think um, everybody read about, now, about us on the magazine and things like that. I think that it's much more what you can receive back by the artist. It's much more that when you give them. And so what I'm trying to do is that. I don't know if... Okay, so about ego, you know, I think every, uh, anything connected with uh, art, it's ego, you know, when you work with artists, you understand the balance of the ego, it's their expression, and the, so, of course, when you start, and especially when you start, or will come already on the level of foundation, of course, you put your ambitions, I would say, to task, to, 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 to get um, a light tower, which you think you want to, to, to go to this journey, to collect and to have a social impact of your collection and uh, to be involved and involve other people. Of course, you have to be driven. And of course, without 
in this case, ego or drive, you cannot do this. And of course, everyone who sits here has this drive, I hope, and I see it. So we can call it, in my, my understanding, this ego is this driving. So as soon as we have it, we can move forward together. And yeah. I call it ambition, and I call it wanting to change things and move things in a certain, you know, in a certain circumstances. Ego is a very funny word. It's also a very tough one, you know, it's like, it's funny that you, yeah. So no, it's more ambition, it's more wanting to move change, advance, shake, I don't know, what's another definition? Well, actually, I think for me, uh, to, to, to do more research and study uh, more from internet or catalog or books from each artist, uh, trying to like get rid of uh, what you like or you don't like, and that's maybe my, my practice. And also in the meantime, when I stay in the city, I try to uh, like reaching out with different collectors and, and museum people from their vision. I also can, can see if it's really uh, 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 like changing my, what we call ego. And, uh, and also I think when I build my uh, collection, I usually find uh, the, the latest world. You have, you have to be build the dialogue with my current uh, collections. Uh, for instance, I will just uh, mention about the trash that I collect. And I, I saw a beautiful fo photograph by uh, Wolfgang Tillman, and it's called the Mermaid uh, Purse. So when you saw it, you know, it's fit into my collection. So, so I, through those kind of uh, products, I try to like, make myself become more rational and to, to make this issue much more uh, rational. For me, it's very simple. I, unfortunately, I don't have a children, so they, they are only with my wife. So uh, we, we, were, we, were, we, we will not have the big problem. So they, I want to donate for my collection, uh, including my house, to the one museum of an institution. Because, yeah, that is like a best way so, to survive my collection. Because I'm a salary man, so they, I'm away from making my private museum. So all of my collection, so yeah, will survive. So it's the best way for me and with my wife, I think. Yeah. So, so to, to ask, us, ask the question about ego, and in, in, maybe in a slightly different way, I guess I, I wonder about the idea of responsibility. Um, which is it? Which you know, in that sense, the traditional museum, uh, you know, has an idea of a kind of longevity and where certain types of kind of a civic role are taken on by that institution. And if you, as a private individual, set up an institution, at what point do you take on that idea of civic responsibility? Um, and how do you think? Of, how long term do you have to think about that? And what happens when, you, as and when you kind of, how sustainable is it? I suppose. So, could you again repeat that? How you want to know how the so as soon as you m once make institution and move your open your door so you become public. So uh, the question is how how responsible do you then feel a responsibility? So how for responsibility that being when or? you open your door and your home becomes a, whatever is it your home with a collection or is it uh, your I don't know museum with a collection and or if as you open the door and it becomes public so you have of course responsibility uh, in society for the mission which you bring to uh, actually you to, to, to bring to society. So I think everyone sitting here understand has a mission statement and uh, I think all of us have this mission stat statement in common and a little bit different. But I think it's a very important uh, for me at least uh, uh, also it's a vice versa process. From one side you see uh, how, how 
uh, your activity has an impact for society. From other side, society is a big uh, actually field where um, your activity is going on. So it's uh, like river, I could say. The process is like a river, and you are during this river, you, you know, it's different islands and uh, different situation. But in general, I say the, the, the very important things for me to be a catalyst so in society like we are. And now it looks like the whole world in the same, so in the problem. Uh, so it's important to be a catalyst of the social and economical change and bring a new, better vision of the future. And, uh, and actually being part of this change and being part of this uh, kind of activism, cultural activism, is really interesting also. And this is what makes a difference. For, for, for all of us has been important not to do something for the people for the visitors. I mean, and for example, in my in my country, as I said before, uh, the first museum for contemporary art opened in 2010. I started collecting in 1992. Uh, there were no museum, no possibility for artists from my country to show their work. Uh, not so many <coughs> gallery like in Germany or in London or in America. So I think that is if you collect uh, in as we. Talk, we already say you you have a relation with the artist and uh, you want to to, do, to give back someone to the society it's normal that you you understand that you have to be much more involved that you have not just to collect and to think to collect in just to hang the works at your the wall of your house so I think that in my case was was a certain way was natural was spontaneous to to go in this direction, and I cannot imagine just to collect by, for my for my house. But I think that uh, it's good to to share with the other, and that is so important if you know how to do or you try to do to give the opportunity to everybody, not only to see the collection or your work or art, but also to understand for that, as I said, it's so important to do classes, laboratory workshop for children, for students, for people with special needs. So this is, I think, it's a normal way if you uh, are, have your ego, obviously, because it's true, at the end we have to have our ego, but also if you, you, you can, you are lucky, you receive so much that it's normal to give back as much as you can, and for, for me, was this the way to work? For another person, can be to support music, uh, dance, uh, or also much important things. But I mean, I think that is quite normal what we we are doing and what we do for our city, our country, and the society. I think there's another question over here. Hello, uh, my name is Roseanne MacDonald, I'm from Ireland and I run an art business conference over there. Um, I suppose I want to direct my question to Pat Patricia first and then get your own opinion as well. You started collecting in 1992 and you speak a lot about giving back, which is, I highly admire that. I'm just wondering, um, from a collection management point of view and from the business of art, how did you get support in terms of if you bought art that there was issues with the authenticity, etc., like that? Was there any resources there from a business point of view to help support your collection management or the do's and don'ts, the pitfalls that you may have come across when you collected art? So it's more access to information from you for you as a collector in terms of business. So, so you mean, sorry. So, so, yes. ba so basically, when, as a collector, and yes. you collect, you have your collection management. Any business issues, so any issues in terms of authenticity or art appraisals that went wrong, um, where were your supports or where were your learning resources for those types of issues back in 1992 and compared to today? Is the world has completely changed for 1992. We, we live in a really different world. When I started collecting in 1992, there were just few places in which you used to go to see art, that means uh, London, Germany, and uh, America, and this was all, there were not so many fair, not so many exhibition. We didn't know about art from Asia, for example. There was art here and good art, but we didn't have many opportunity. So it was completely different when I started collecting. And I have to say that at that moment also the market was so different. For example, 
auction for me was something that I didn't know at the beginning of my of my collection. There were not uh, so many auctions. Were, it, was, it was quite a completely way to live art. I remember my first uh, biennial in Venezia. No parties, no nothing. Just uh, uh, dinner in the small uh, restaurant, osteria in Venezia with the artist and with the gallerist. So obviously the world has changed a lot I think that is good because now it's bigger, now there are so many um, artists uh, collectors and galleries and auction houses and so I really believe that has changed a lot um, in my case if I talk about myself I never bought work of art by speculation, I never thought of the market even because at that moment there was not so much market, if I say how different was to buy art at that moment. Now, if you want to buy a work of art, you have to take the decision in two minutes because there is a long list waiting not to have the work. When I started, I can spend weeks, uh, a month before. So, also because now, as you say, there is web, internet, everything is so so quickly easy to take. Yes, everything is fast. You have no time. Uh, no, it's, you, you just saw a work and you received an email from the gallery. Are you interested because there is no? So, it's changed a lot of work. What I think that uh, it's so important is the word change, but for me was it's always the same that I never bought and never buy art by speculation. I never think um, if the artist will be famous, what will be. I never bought works but names, but I always work both. Uh, works but not names and I want to work in this direction work with the young generation even now I don't work with the all early artists which when I start to, 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 to buy 26 years old and I go ahead with my young artists with new, new artists producing new work and this is my, my way to, to, to collect and to be involved in art, no speculation, not names, but works. What is really important is to be able to find the right work. And I always say when I ask me, um, a collector can discover an artist. I don't think so. A collector doesn't discover an artist. A collector has to be able to to, um, to buy a work or to read a work just a, a moment before it becomes com common language. This makes the difference if you are able to do that. But I don't think that we are also um, discovering artists. So we are we're collectors and it's so interesting for me to, to, to... There is like a feel rouge between me and my artists, but the biography, my biography, that is something so important for me in my way to collect. I think we've got time for one more, if, any, if, anybody, if anybody has one. Down the front here. Um, this is just a very quick question. And, um, I just want to ask if you have ever sold your collection, and if you did, can you talk about that experience? <laughs> uh, well, actually, the uh, for my collection is changing from time to time, and I, I was as I just mentioned that I I starting from modern uh, overseas Chinese painting, and then a switch to YBA, and then contemporary. But uh, actually, I did sell some of my works uh, for my uh, early uh, collections to support my uh, contemporary sections uh, collection, and they mainly are like modern related. I still have like half of it uh, with me, but I, I to support my uh, continued contemporary collections, I had to, uh, I had to do that. But again, you know, there, there are many uh, friends asking me that, you know, uh, well, our uh, collection is a good investment. Uh, usually I, I told them it's no. Uh, the, the answer is no, because uh, the liquidating, liquidation takes forever. Uh, when you decided to sell one work, and, and then the time you get your uh, 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 money, probably like one or two years later, and especially nowadays, you know, so... So uh, I, my, I saw my collection, but mainly uh, like modern painting, not a uh, contemporary section. I, yes, I, I, when I started collecting, I started collecting artists 
very my generational, my, my same generation, and so obviously I don't want to sell this work. But I also bought some work of earlier work of the 60s and so on. And in this case, yes, the first part of this collection, I, I sold some works just in order to support a new project, new commission. So I completely agree. Yes, this can happen, and I don't think that is is wrong, but what I want to say that generally, no, I don't sell my work. I, don't, I never bought a work of art thinking maybe in two years this work can, uh, can double or triple the, the, of the price and so I buy and, I, and then I re put on the market. Absolutely no, I want to say that uh, I bought some works in the Past year, that then the, the galleries or other colleagues asked me to sell, be also good price, but j I don't want to do that. I don't like the idea to speculate on my collection or my artist. I want to correct, and the few times that I decided to, to sell the work, I went to the gallery, I talked to the gallery, and we decided how to, to do. But I really, no, my collection is, every work is part of my life. I remember the moment in which I bought the work. I remember the moment in which I talked with the artist. So it's uh, really the collection become a part of your life, and so it's not easy to separate from your keys. So can you imagine? Yeah, so, so in my case, I bought a few works, and I really believe that it's important to keep the collection. Yeah, I agree with Patricia. It's very difficult because collecting is also a personal journey. It's something that's very, very personal. But I collect every artist I work with, and I sell those artists. But again, it's very personal. It's the only thing that I sell. I think we might have to leave it there, actually. Um, we've kind of run out of time. So it just uh, leaves me to say thank you so much to all of our panelists. And thank you for everybody being here. And um, 